This episode is sponsored by Masterworks, the art investing platform. More about them at the end of the video. In 1922, a team of British archaeologists in Egypt, led by Howard Carter, discovered a previously unexplored tomb, which allegedly was the burial place of the famous pharaoh Tutankhamun. The discovery amazed the scientists, not only because of its value, but also because of the multiple questions that came up right after they found it. The treasures in the tomb had been left untouched for over 3,000 years, all the while other burial places were plundered multiple times. The mummy was somewhat slapdash, even though ancient Egyptians had perfected the mummification technique, researchers began to doubt that it really was King Tut's mummy. It wasn't until recently that scientists used CT scans to produce the digital image of the buried person's face and find out the truth. However, to this day, the world is baffled by another question. Why did the scientists who entered the tomb die one after another? When one of Carter's team members died, tales of the pharaoh's curse spread across Europe. Rumor had it that those who entered the tomb would soon afterward fall sick or suffer a slew of hardships. But if the curse did exist, it must have started from King Tut himself. But who might have cursed the boy king and why? Tutankhamun ascended the throne in 1332 BC. It was a time when Egypt was at war with a neighboring kingdom, Nubia. Tutankhamun was just nine years old. Since the boy couldn't reign on his own, he got an advisor named A. A helped the young king restore Egypt, which, in addition to the war it was waging, was also going through the consequences brought by the reign of the heretic king Akhenaten. In his 17 years as pharaoh, Akhenaten implemented a major religious reform. Namely, he made ancient Egyptians forget all the ancient Egyptian gods for the sake of a single deity, Aten. The pharaoh outlawed other cults and ordered that old temples be torn down. He built a new capital city, Akhetaten, better known today as Amarna, and spent piles of money to build new temples in the name of the new god. Although all those temples were for the king's private use only. Akhenaten declared that only he had the right to worship Aten. As for the people, they had to redirect the religious loyalty they had demonstrated to their old gods, now it was all to go to Akhenaten. These changes undermined tradition and greatly affected Egypt's social and political life. Eventually, Akhenaten was declared a heretic, and his name was obliterated after his death. But one person never forgot this name. He couldn't. It was Akhenaten's son and heir, Tutankhamun. Although the boy inherited the half-ruined kingdom and his father's mistakes to deal with, that wasn't the real curse for Tutankhamun. Akhenaten condemned his son to suffer even before his birth. For a long time, Tutankhamun was considered to be a son of Nefertiti. Scientists believe those were her remains in the tomb of Amenhotep III, Tutankhamun's grandfather. But Nefertiti never bore the title of king's daughter and so couldn't be buried with Amenhotep. In 2010, DNA tests of the mummy revealed that it wasn't Nefertiti at all. It was an unnamed daughter of Amenhotep III and his wife Tia. In other words, she was Akhenaten's sister. A child of incest, Tutankhamun was born with a long list of genetic disorders, including forefoot and skull deformities and a cleft hard palate. He looked something like this. This reconstruction, based on CT scans, is the work of scientists from France, the US, and Egypt, which they performed in 2005. They used over 1,500 images of the mummy. While the researchers offered an unprecedented look at the most famous Egyptian find, the results of their work failed to shed light on the mystery of King Tut's untimely death. And obvious facts imply that he suffered a great deal. 
Moreover, the curse of the gods haunted Tutankhamun even in afterlife. Perhaps this very curse became the bane of the scientists who explored the king's tomb. Very soon after he visited King Tut's tomb, rich American financier George J. Gould came down with an infection, dying several months later. George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who was Howard Carter's partner and the main sponsor of the expedition, also died of a baffling infection one year after he had entered the tomb. Five months later, sepsis killed his brother, explorer and diplomat Colonel Aubrey Herbert. And that's when the most exciting part begins. Some believe that Tutankhamun also died of an infection. Still, even though Tutankhamun's mummy has been a subject of research for almost a hundred years, scientists still cannot reach an agreement as to the manner of his death. Say, one version is that Tutankhamun was killed with a blow to his head. Scientists thought of this as an explanation for bone fragments found inside the skull. They're easy to notice in the x-ray images taken in the 60s. The pharaoh's mummy also had a broken leg and most of its rib cage was missing. This led scientists to believe that King Tut was crashed into by a chariot, maybe even twice. The main suspect in this case is the king's advisor, A. He would have gained the most benefit from Tutankhamun's assassination. After all, A succeeded him as pharaoh and married his beloved, Ankh Senamun. A was only in line for the throne because 18-year-old Tutankhamun died having left no heirs behind. His stillborn children were buried together with him. And here's an odd detail, some scientists were also murdered. A member of the royal family, Prince Ali Kamel Fami Bey, was shot. Howard Carter's secretary, Captain Richard Bethel, was found strangled in his own room in an elite London club. That was after a series of fires in his home where valuable Egyptian artifacts were stored. Although the most terrible death awaited Dr. Aaron Ember, a friend of Howard Carter who was also present when the tomb was opened. Ember perished in a fire in his own home when he was trying to save his manuscript entitled The Egyptian Book of the Dead. It's quite interesting that Tutankhamun's mummy also suffered in a fire when it was in its sarcophagus. You might think these are mere coincidences, but still, what if these are all parts of one and the same curse? Tutankhamun's undisturbed tomb leads to the idea that people might be wary of coming in there for fear of summoning the wrath of the gods. It even feels like the priests and workers who mummified and buried the young pharaoh rushed it also, as if afraid of something. Between the opening of the tomb and the unsealing of the last sarcophagus, three years passed. That's how much time researchers needed to carefully dismantle heaps of artifacts and then open all five of King Tut's burial shrines and his three sarcophagi. For as long as they worked there, the archaeologists were haunted by doubts that the tomb was supposed to be someone else's. Most things in it bore the names of Akhenaten, Amenhotep III, and unknown high-ranking people. And when it came to coffins, they were utterly bewildered. The thing is, the three sarcophagi in the shape of a human body were put into one another and then placed in so-called wooden shrines. Apparently, the outer coffin turned out to be too large and the pharaoh's toes ended up sticking out of the shrine. The lid had to be closed, so his toes were just cut off. 3,000 years later, Howard Carter found them at the base of the sarcophagus. The second coffin, the one in the middle, was for some reason made in the shape of a woman. The Egyptologist concluded that his sarcophagus, along with some other artifacts, was initially made for the mysterious Nefer-Nefer Ruaten, the female pharaoh whose name is written in some places on the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb. Apparently, she lived at the same time as Akhenaten, but died earlier. Howard Carter theorized that King Tut was buried in her coffin for a reason. The most likely explanation is that the king's death was unexpected and his own tomb and sarcophagi weren't ready. When the Egyptologists lifted the lid of the last coffin, 
they were in for another odd surprise. The mummy was charred. Further study revealed that the undertakers literally flooded the mummy in oils and resin, which caused the fire in the sealed sarcophagus. To add insult to injury, the liquid solidified and glued linen bandages together. The archaeologists were unable to unwrap the mummy and had to take the bandages off piece by piece. The mummy itself ended up glued to the bottom of the coffin. The researchers had to cut it into pieces that could be taken out. Could it be the result of mere negligence by the pharaoh's undertakers? Ancient Egyptians believed their pharaohs only became stronger in the afterlife because they went closer to the gods. That's why they treated mummification with great care and respect. They recorded their knowledge and rituals in the so-called Book of the Dead. For instance, according to the scripture, a pharaoh's heart was always kept inside the mummy. It was believed that the ruler needed the organ to continue their reign in the afterlife. King Tut's mummy didn't have a heart. Instead, it was left with a scarab-shaped amulet. Interestingly, a heart attack was considered the official cause of death of Richard Bethel, Howard Carter's secretary, although Bethel had never suffered from any heart disease. Besides the missing heart, the scientists found other unusual damage on the young pharaoh's body. This included a hole in the skull. In 2005, after CT scanning, scientist Zahi Hawass confirmed that the injury was inflicted after the pharaoh's death and that the blow wasn't an accident. It was a premeditated puncture made during mummification. As a rule, a mummy's brain would be taken out through the nostrils, but for some reason it was different for Tutankhamun. In his case, they just made a hole in his skull. An embalming cut was also odd-looking. Such a cut would usually be made on the side of an abdomen to remove organs before mummification, but the cut on Tutankhamun's body was made diagonally from the hip to the navel and was huge. It seemed that his undertakers just wanted to get done with the burial as quickly as possible. Maybe they were afraid that whatever killed the pharaoh would kill them too. It may be that it was also the fear of Ramesses the Great, a pharaoh who ruled after Tutankhamun and brought Egypt to a new high. He did more than anyone else to sweep history clean of all the traces of Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, and other heretics of Amarna. Following his orders, other tombs were built above the boy king's tomb so that it was impossible to get anywhere near it. Even his contemporaries believe King Tut's tomb was lost and forgotten. And some scientists think all those peculiarities and rushed mummification and burial weren't because the pharaoh's court believed in the curse but because the ancient Egyptians faced an unfamiliar infectious disease, and that this very infection could have killed the members of Carter's expedition team. But is it really possible to determine the exact cause of Tutankhamun's death? 3,000 years ago, people just couldn't know anything about such things as, say, Aspergillus. This genus of fungi was discovered in several tombs in the Valley of the Kings. It can live both inside and in the open air. This mold can trigger a serious infection in people with a weakened immune system. There were at least three of them in the expedition. Jay Gould, Lord Carnarvon, and his brother Audrey Herbert. Besides, scientists have concluded the most plausible causes of King Tut's death to be a broken leg, a fractured rib cage, and yes, an infectious disease. A detailed analysis of the mummy revealed that Tutankhamun had a vascular bone necrosis in the foot and ankle. To put it simply, his bone died because of poor blood flow. But the remaining artifacts tell us that the young man spent his entire life with a cane. And true, not long before his death, he did break his leg. As for the mummy's rib cage, it turned out to be not fractured, but literally missing. It was stolen in the 60s with the pharaoh's precious collar, which lay against it. It also completely rebukes the theory that a chariot ran over the pharaoh. So, this leaves us with an infection as the only possible explanation, doesn't it? 
In 2009, Zahi Hawass completed a comprehensive radiological and genetic study of 11 mummies of rulers from the 18th dynasty of Egypt, including Tutankhamun. He concluded that the most plausible cause of the pharaoh's death was a combination of a vascular necrosis, leg fracture, and malaria. But malaria is not a virus. It's a parasite that can only be transmitted from person to person via female mosquito bites. And even if this diagnosis can be considered final when it comes to the death of the pharaoh himself, with all of the mummification slips explained by the rush of Ramesses restless to ascend the throne, why did the archaeologist die then? The mysterious deaths of Carter's team members baffled many people for decades, but some of them had quite natural and mundane explanations. Lord Carnarvon died of pneumonia, which followed a streptococcal skin infection. He shaved over a mosquito bite on his face, which infected his blood. So it's not surprising that this later developed into pneumonia. The Earl had a weakened immune system. He spent many years in warm countries trying to manage his lung disease. One of those countries was Egypt. As for other team explorers who died of disease, their average age should be factored in. It was 75 years. Many of them started the expedition with undetermined health in the first place. Granted, there was also Aaron Ember who tragically perished in the fire. Ember had time to save himself but decided to save his manuscripts instead. The expedition leader, Howard Carter, also died of natural causes 16 years after the tomb was opened. However, the circumstances under which the rest of the team members died seemed too unexpected. Historian and writer Mark Benon found proof that several mysterious London deaths attributed to the curse of King Tut turned out to be murders. All of them had one perpetrator. Alistair Crowley. In 2011, The Telegraph published an article about this. Crowley was a writer of prose and poetry and a mountaineer. He was also an occultist and mystic, obsessed with the story of Jack the Ripper. Crowley dedicated this serial killer many pages of his journals and books. It was by studying Crowley's writings that Mark Bainon joined the pieces of the puzzle. For example, it wasn't a secret that Prince Ali Kamofami Bay was shot by his wife, Marie Marguerite. But few knew that Marie Marguerite was Aleister Crowley's lover. The girl was also a first-class courtesan and also worked in a restaurant that Crowley frequented. Mr. Bainon assumes that Crowley instigated her to commit murder. The couple's next victim was Aubrey Herbert, who died soon after Marie Marguerite was found not guilty. Just think, Herbert was born with a degenerative eye disease and went completely blind closer to the end of his life, and his dentist assumed his teeth were to blame, advising him to remove the teeth to get his eyesight back. But the surgery at the private clinic suspiciously went awry. Mr. Bainon thinks that Crowley used Marie Marguerite to do his dirty work again. Crowley could also be involved with the death of Howard Carter's secretary, Captain Richard Bethel, who was found strangled in his bed in the Gentleman's Club. It was initially assumed that he died of a heart attack, but Bethel had been perfectly well. Crowley, on the other hand, spent quite a lot of time in those days meeting with writer Somerset Maugham in that very same Gentleman's Club. Mark Bainon claims there are multiple indirect clues in Crowley's journals that connect him with the deaths. But the most important part is Crowley's belief system, which was full of references to ancient Egypt. He considered the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb a desecration. He might well have thought of himself as a doer of the god's will and embodied the notorious curse of the pharaoh. Anyway, how come a serial killer describing his crimes in his own books went unnoticed? It may be because the public at that time was focused on another writer, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was the first to assume that Lord Carnarvon's death was caused not by pneumonia, but by the elementals created by Tutankhamun's priest to guard the tomb. Conan Doyle started a chain reaction, which was then supported by journalists, especially by the Daily Mail, 
which would blow every single death of anyone involved in the discovery out of proportion. Howard Carter himself adamantly denied the theory of the curse and called Conan Doyle's speculations rubbish. He might have been right, but it's hard to accuse the Daily Mail and Arthur Conan Doyle of chasing headlines. After all, while every individual death connected to the expedition may be explained with common and clear causes, the combination and sequence of these deaths make one think that the curse did exist to an extent. And if you're still unsure about it, you might want to learn about the death of another team member who I haven't mentioned before. Historian and archaeologist Hugh Evelyn White was a man of sound mind and a sound body who helped Howard Carter. He took his own life. I have succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear. These were his last words. But let's step aside from misfortune and curses. Here's a bonus story. The $195 million bullet. It's 1964. Andy Warhol finishes a series of Marilyn Monroe paintings. A photographer asks to shoot them, and Warhol assumes photos. Instead, a single bullet right through Marilyn's forehead. Fast forward to this summer. Shot Blue Marilyn fetches $195 million at auction. Now, the crazy part isn't the bullet, but the big picture. That record-breaking sale happened as $9 trillion was wiped from portfolios and inflation soared to 40-year highs. But fine art has lower volatility than other investments, says Morgan Stanley. Masterworks, the art investing platform, knows the power of this asset firsthand. Their last three exits returned over 13, 17, and 21% net to their investors. That brings Masterworks to seven sales just this year. From filing art like Warhol's with the SEC, splitting it into shares, and selling it again, this isn't crypto or NFTs. Masterworks filings on sec.gov are linked below. Masterworks is adding new offerings constantly, but you get priority access at the link below.